I like. When did you meet Elton? I met him through Ed Roland of Collective Soul. Oh, no um, way. And I've known, That's awesome. known Ed for a long time. And, and um, he was really good friends with Elton. So I was recording and Ed was in the studio and I said, um, hey, man, I've been wanting to do this Elton John song called Border Song. And I wonder, uh, I know you know him. And he goes, yeah, I know him. He, 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 I said, do you think he would come and play on it? And he goes, man, he'll play on it, sing on it, whatever you want. He, he said, no one ever, wow. he said, no one ever asks him. Wow. And man. so we all went out to dinner and. This is Tokyo tonight. Tonight, uh, yeah, you're basically like Alan Grant from the Jurassic Park, uh, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> like, w w what did I fucking touch, guys? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really felt like that in the studio over the years. There have been times when the engineers just tell me to get out of the room. <laughs> They're like, Sean, for some reason, the electromagnetic spectrum is not happening around you right now. <laughs> can, yeah. you, can you guys just get clear of the room? Oh, that's pretty great, man. Well, thanks for doing this, dude. I oh, man, it. thanks for um, having me. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's uh, it's an honor, dude. I've been a fan for a long time. And it was cool getting to like just meet you uh, with Glenn and just hang out that and was. like shoot the shit, man. That was great. I know. It was really good meeting you, too, and, and good uh, catching up with you and and uh, I've I've dove back into your comedy. It's been really great. I, I knew of you before, but it's really nice to catch up on some stuff that I, you know, you know how it is, man. There's so absolutely. much, so much out there. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you. I appreciate you even taking the time to to look it back up, man. It it is crazy too, because like you know, I you don't even realize how much time goes by before you see people that you enjoy or like or whatever until like I didn't realize it really until like. Uh, like, you know, the pandemic kind of set everything time wise into like a different perspective and, and, and basically like motion because we lost so much time. And then when you yeah. see people after the fact, they're like, what happened to you? And I'm like, well, that's a weird way to say hello, but all right. <laughs> um, yeah, it yeah. is. It does feel kind of like um, lost time and also uh, just time where it also felt like borrowed time in a way, you know, where like for folks like you and I or many others that have to travel with their work. Um, yeah. Not not getting to entertain people and all of that. And then so you end up in this whole other world, you know, where you're at right. home or you're in a space. And I kind of liked it. Um, Me too. You know, I got to where I really liked it. The, sorry about moving locations here. I'm gonna, no, no worries. I'm going to go to my original spot. Um, yeah. My beagle's barking, so. <laughs> what a great expression, by the way. That could mean that could mean literally anything. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It's like John Candy and planes, trains, and automobiles. My dogs are barking. <laughs> my God, that is by far one of my all-time favorite movies. I watch it every year on Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's such a good one. He yeah. was he was the perfect sad clown, wasn't he? Oh, totally, absolutely. H have you seen the Steve Martin documentary that's out on Apple? No, not yet. No. Oh man, there is a. Uh, it's so good. It's a two parter because it it his, it covers like you know his early life and whatever, but it covers the first part covers the majority of his rise in stand up. Okay. And then it end the first part ends with him leaving, you know, like when he walked away from that. And then the rest of it continues to movies, banjo playing, you know, um, uh, writing and all that other stuff. Um, but there's a scene where he's got this room full of his old scripts. Every movie that he's done is like leather bound scripts. And it's the planes, trains and automobile script. And he pulls it out and he goes um, and he goes, there's this great monologue that John does um you know at the end of the movie and they cut it for some he goes you know i guess for time or whatever it is and he goes but i it's when he tells me you know um when i find out that he's been homeless 
and that his wife had died. And he basically, and he, and he opens it up and he reads and he goes, but I'm standing across from him and I'm crying. You know, I'm like trying to hold it together in the scene. And he says, um, he goes, he's got this beautiful line where he goes, you know, I could handle the Julys and the Junes and the Octobers. And he goes, but you know, it's the holidays where I hold on, tend to hold on to people tighter. And with you, for some reason, I just couldn't let go. And then Steve Martin starts to choke up and I'm sitting there watching this documentary. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You know? Yeah. Like, it, yeah, it's just great. Oh man. And I'm, I'm a massive Steve Martin fan too. I mean, I, yeah. I grew up on my brother, you know, I'm 57 now, just turned 57 a month ago. Oh, congrats, man. Oh, congrats. thanks. And my, my brother got Let's Get Small when it came out. Oh, so I was so probably good. like, you know, 10 years old, something like mm -hmm. that. And, right. and it was the A track and, and man, I memorized it. I memorized it. I love that thing. I didn't even know what he was talking about most of the time, <laughs> you know, being that age and, yeah. and uh, some of the political references and none of the sexual references. And so, you know, right. but it's just, I just loved him as an entertainer and I love the movies too. And, and uh, did you read his book, Born Standing Up? Oh, I did. Yeah. I yeah. It's the best book on stand up I've ever read. Isn't that great? And it sounds like the yeah. documentary that first half might kind of be like the book was in a way, right? It was absolutely. They were definitely, I think they, they were definitely, they, they took excerpts from his audio version of the book and like placed it and throughout that uh, yeah. first part. It was beautiful. Yeah. I, um, bet. I remember, I remember reading that book. That's one of those things where like, and I'm sure you've had this happen too, where you've read an, another artist that you admire, like their trajectory in the business or whatever. And it makes you refall in love with, why you did it in the first place or why you started. And you're like, I needed this. This is a very nice, you know, gift to the world. Yeah. You know, I, I actually had that experience yesterday. No. I get it a lot. And, and I think if, as long as I, I'm open and I'm kind of always listening and not just to music, but comedy as well and, um, and reading, but, but music especially does that for me. And, and, um, and records, uh, recordings, I guess I should say of things, things that yeah. I'm listening to. And I, and I, when I was a kid uh, around before that time that I was mentioning, my dad had, he had stolen, I'm sure the record because he, I, I mentioned it in my shows before, but my dad worked at a, a record store as a second job and he yeah. would steal all the promotional copies and bring them to our house. If they, if, if the records were any good. That's you know, right. So we had this yeah. killer record collection from the early seventies, late sixties, all that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but one of those records was Jose Feliciano live in London at the Palladium, wow. at the Palladium. And my first uh, hearing of light, my, uh, light my fire was his mm -hmm. version, not the doors. Wow. And so I grew up on that version, which is really something, you know, it's a really cool yeah. version, not to it really, is. not to be compared to the doors. It's just a different thing, but, and, uh, sure. so yeah, I've been listening to that record over the last couple of days and it's so wonderful. It takes you back to, uh, to where you were when you first would, would put that needle down and listen over and over to, to it, yeah. you know, and uh, it's cool to see that he's still out there doing it on some level, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's another thing too. like, uh, you know, after the, you know, after the, all the lockdowns and stuff like that, it was just, it's great to see everybody kind of coming back out. You know, that if there's, if there's a couple silver linings to that, it was definitely people realizing they still had either something to say, something to show in their art. And then it just became this thing of like, I, I feel like this is kind of one of the best times to go out and see people live, especially people that you haven't seen. Like, I think I went to see right after this thing happened, like tears for fears started touring again. Right. And it was like, they hadn't been out in like 15 years or something like that. And I was like, I, I gotta go. Like, I, there's no way I'm going to miss it, you know? And, and it was, they were great. They're great. That's a great yeah. band. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And even they're like, it, what's cool was like their new stuff fucking crushed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, there were, there was stuff that I hadn't heard and I was like, this is incredible. So yeah, it was, it's, it makes you happy to be a part of, uh, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I love it too. And, you know, <clears throat> I'm having to do, 
you know, yeah, I, I don't know how much you still do stand up and get out there and travel a lot. I, I'm still doing maybe 60 to 70 shows a year. That's all. Um, and as you know, that's not very much. Uh, and, uh, I know at one point I was doing 250, 260, yeah. you know, just that kind of grind. And, um, but you know, once you have a kid and, and, uh, it, everything kind of changes for me, it did anyway. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I've just really, I do enjoy doing it, but I'm, it's, I'm kind of more picky and choosy now, you know, I'm like, I don't yeah. want, I don't want to play everywhere. I, I, I mean, you know, just, it's too tiring for one. I got, it, it, it just about kills me to go out for more than a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Absolutely. And, and the, I, I love that you said the being more choosy thing, because that was something that, um, I take uh, my friend Joanne, one of my best friends uh, in it's in life and, and in comedy. We started together, but like as soon as I started headlining, I was like, "Do you want to go out on the road?" Because I don't want to be paired with some lunatic. Uh, and right. we just, we just, we love all the same music. We love showing each other new music stuff. So it's you know half the fun is that drive to wherever the fuck we're going, yeah, and then getting on stage and everything else in between is work. But like that's the best parts. Um, but we were very, we got very choosy about like, I don't need to be doing these, these gigs anymore. Like, you know, that I, that I just, to, but I, I, that's a great, I have a great question for you about, uh, I like how I complimented myself. I have a great question coming up. You're like, that's, <laughs> that's garbage, by the way. <laughs> I won't, I you're won't like, tell you it's a great question because you already did. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'll be the judge of that. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but like, so you were, you were saying you were doing like, you know, and I know that grind too, where you're doing like 150, 250 gigs, whatever. And then you take it back down to 70. Do you have, or, or like, was there some kind of adjustment you had to make, um, to tell yourself as a musician or as a creative or an artist that you don't need to be out there as much? Because like, there's something I think ingrained in everybody, especially, especially for comedians. Like when we start out, it's like, if you're not out there. Or you don't want to be out there every night. You're fucking. You you'll just get bad. You won't get good. But like, there also has to be a certain point where you know you you have to kind of tell yourself like, uh, you know, okay, look, I've been doing this long enough. I I have the con. I I have to reassure myself that you know, uh, talent doesn't rust. I may have to shake some shit off every now and again, but for the most part, I got this, and I don't need to be doing that. Was that like that for? you going down to, to like fewer gigs for yourself? Like how does your brain function with like, you I know, think out, do you have any? Yeah. As you were saying that, what, what came to my mind, mind was age, I think, you know, and, and like how long I've done it. Sure. Is, is, is what affects that the greatest because, um, you know, I really do love doing it still, but, yeah. um, but I think, yeah, I think, I think it's age, it's wear and tear, um, you know, and then you, you're right. You do have to kind of have a balance. You, you don't want to go out rusty. Um, yeah. you know, bands tend to good bands tend to rehearse a lot before they go on tour. You mm -hmm. know, I tend to work up set lists, different songs if, if I can, if I have time. Um, but I also tend to play, you know, it's different for comedians. I think you can't, you probably have to constantly change your, your set and your stuff. Right. right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then repeating that wouldn't be, I guess maybe once in a while you could do that for fun. Right. Like to poke, poke something in from, from a while back, but it's not cool yeah. probably to, to go out and do your regular stuff all the time. Right. You, you want yeah, to, I, keep... I always have new stuff like, yeah. and I, and, I, and it just got into that habit because of what you just said, like when they, when you start out, they're very much like, okay, these audiences, I was there, I was in this place last year. If I come back and people come back and see me again with the same shit, like right. they're going like without, without any new stuff sprinkled in, they're going to be like, I can't come back again. They'll come back and see you twice. They won't come back and see you right. like a third and fourth time again, unless they think it's new. That's really different than, than the music. You know, I, in my world anyway, they, yeah. they've got their favorites that they want to hear. And so you, <clears throat> you know, you're going to need to do those and I don't mind doing them. Um, yeah. and then, and then hopefully you're, you're coming up with new stuff too, but I don't think that not for me anyway, it wouldn't be the same at all. Like I don't feel that. Right, right. Yeah. I don't feel that kind of pressure to have 
10 new songs a tour or something or, or each year even like mm -hmm. i write so slowly now too that's another thing <laughs> it's ridiculous it's i almost go okay yeah, you know but i really want to get back to writing by myself i spent years co-writing right and um and you know it's a completely different animal it's you there's, there's help, you know, you have to do it all by yourself. It's a different thing. And yeah. I enjoy that. And I, you know, of course I started off that way doing it for many years, but so, but I do, I do write slower now. So I tend to not be in a hurry to put out a new album or, you know, and there's, you seem like you're kinder, like to yourself, like, cause I know that, you know, um, when you're, when you're definitely, when you're younger, you're like kind of beating yourself up over not turning stuff out, but it sounds like you're just, very kind to yourself about like, yeah, man, this is just what I, who I am right now. And I'll, and I'll get an album out when I'm ready. Like, is that the vibe? Yeah. That's good. And it wasn't like that when I was younger, that's for sure. I mean, sure. of course, if you're signed to Columbia records and Sony music, you're going to have plenty of, um, uh, even unspoken pressure, you know, like that. You know, so there was a, I, I put out what I, when I look back on it, the second Sony release, I wish they would have let me put out the first one I delivered. Right. It, it was a cooler record, but they wanted hits. So I, I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll write some more and see what I come up with. And I co-wrote with a couple of people that, and we came up with some more poppy kind of stuff, which is what they wanted. But my, right. my audience didn't resonate with it. You know, they, right. they thought, they thought about it what I think about it now when I listen to it. I'm like, yeah, it's not, you know. And so, and that's the only real big mistake I've made in that all of that. But, but it's a big one because, yeah, because you go from almost two million records to about two hundred and fifty the next one, you know. And so, right, right. And so, but I'm not, and that's what really made me start thinking about why am I doing this again? Because I, I had been doing it for. 12 or 13 years at that point. So, you know, once, sure. once I was ready to leave Columbia records, I, and I, I really did want to go with like some little label again, you know? Yeah. And I'd done my own label for 10 years. Um, so, and it, it does mean less commercial success when you do that, of course, but I, I just wanted to get back to the kind of doing what I naturally do and what I would be proud of doing, you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And and it's kind of funny, the change in, especially in the times where it's like the audience, you know, now versus then, like, obviously, then it was massively important to be signed, you know, with uh, a, a record label and all that other stuff too. And not that it isn't now, but it's, it's interesting because now the audience is the, like, if you already have a cultivated audience, you're pretty gold you know what i mean like you can sell out you know a, a smaller theaters or theaters and you know whatever wherever you're going mm -hmm. and now it's like those places columbia records won't give anybody anything unless you have that audience whether you're good or not right so it, the the balance it's so funny to, it's interesting to hear you talk about how like they were like yeah we want you to put out more poppy stuff and you're like but that's not what my audience wants and they're like yeah but <laughs> that's what well, we want you know well and it's interesting because they were smart enough to never really say what i said to you uh, you oh, know right. yeah like the pre like the president at the time they had just switched presidents from don einer who was very intimidating and uh mm. like i'm sure he's a, a good guy but he was just intimidating and, sure. and then the vice president was Will Botwin, who became the president when Don left. Now, okay. Will had been the manager of Los Lobos, Steve Earle, um, um, Roseanne Cash, and a lot of Americana cool stuff. Um, yeah. So now he's the new president. So I'm thinking this is perfect, right? You know. Right. Absolutely. Because the the word Americana hadn't even been introduced, but that's kind of when I knew that's kind of what I was in a way. It's kind of this combination of whatever you know it's a bunch of different stuff um yeah. and but yeah he he called me and said you know we just need something we can knock down the doors at radio with that's what he said it wasn't okay. i need it to be more poppy you know you know yeah. it was more of like you know so you know and i tr and i tried <laughs> yeah no i mean and was it <laughs> was it god damn it i tried <laughs> 
Yeah, I believe. Yeah, exactly, man. It's so funny. It's like I, I, I always find it interesting when a, when people come into another artist's world and they're like they know they they see what's working and what got them where they are, and then automatically they try to like switch the gear. And I'm like, just elevate the. And they do that with comedians in comedy all the time too. Like you know, they they find you. I've had this happen to me. I mean, I just recently I've had to drop and switch management and all that other stuff because you know, they find me, they kind of pluck you into their world mm -hmm. and they, they do this thing where they're like, we love this. We love what you're doing. We love blah, 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 blah. And then you sign. And then they're like, here's what you're going to do now. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like me. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, it's like when you get into a relationship and they, you know, they fall in love with you and then they slowly change you and then they want to leave. And they're like, you're not the same person you were. And I'm like, you <laughs> fucking, you made me wear this shit. I used to be cool. <laughs> like, like, what happened? It's like what, that old Sam Kennison routine about, about, uh, you know, if you really want to lose lose the person in your relationship you you start doing a bunch of blow and you grow a beard and you sell the tv and then <laughs> yeah and they're like you're not the, the man i fell in love with i'm leaving yes absolutely <laughs> he's the fucking best he's the best yeah yeah i was oh, my i loved him too and i i'm a really big bill hicks fan to this day and oh yeah and i really just you know i feel like you know over the last 10 20 years things are catching up to what he was already doing you know it's yep. really interesting it's, it's so funny when you see guys like that and um and carlin and all those guys who were like you know on one hand you're like my god they were so uh rel like some simultaneously relevant and ahead of their time and then you also kind of get sad because you're like my god the same shit they were talking about is still fucking happening yeah. you know from like the 70s and up you're like how is this possible yeah yeah, it's that brilliant. whole it's that whole truth telling and comedy thing that yeah. res it always resonates the the best, doesn't it? Absolutely, it's like why I love you know uh, that's the kind of comedy I always you know enjoyed any kind of social commentary, anything taking from you know what's what people might actually be thinking but are afraid to say or yeah. what they're feeling or whatever. It's like you know my generation we loved you know um, we pretty much came up with like John Stewart like at the helm of the daily show. And yeah. it's so weird to see him back because at the same time, you're like, again, it's that thing of like, Oh my God, like this is great nostalgia. We feel like the guy's back that we grew up watching. And then you're like, he's back because nothing got changed. You know, nothing's fit. right. There's a reason he's back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're like, Holy fuck. This is brutal. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about, so, so does, you know, Post Grammy stuff, because I also want to go back into like, you know, obviously how you how you got started and everything. But what is it like post Grammys? Is it better for you after like, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's better in some ways. But did you feel um, an immense amount of pressure or change anything like after all that kind of happened? You know what I mean? Like musically and career wise or were you mm -mm. just riding the wave? No, I didn't feel any different other than, That's wow, great. I can't believe I got nominated for a Grammy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that was about it. I mean, That's cool, man. as soon as they said who was who I was up against, you know, I was like, okay, well, I don't have a chance, but <laughs> but that's pretty cool. And, right. and, and, and then you also don't know, you know, I've heard that it's, it's pretty political and it's kind of bought and paid for all of it. And, yeah, it is nominate nominations and 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 the actual Grammys, but but uh, I don't know that for sure. I'm you know um, I don't have proof yeah. of it, but um, no, I I was proud of it, and uh, I remember going though and kind of feeling like a you know like a redneck or or like white trash or I just mm. I felt really like un underdressed, even though I had gotten a new suit. <laughs> 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 and you know i mean i'm just you know i get a lot of my clothes at thrift stores you know it's just that's kind of the way i've always rolled and right i remember the first attorney that i got to try to help me in the music business he thought i was a homeless guy that had wandered into his office you know and and, and he loves to tell that story to this day um right and i'm like you know fuck you man <laughs> okay so i've got a wool plaid 
you know, jacket on that I got at the thrift store. But, yeah. um, yeah, but yeah, you know, the, I'm right there with you though. I love looking for that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, that's the best. It's good. And, and, uh, yeah. but I, yeah, I remember going and not feeling, you know, I just didn't stay very long. I gotcha. Okay. I remember leaving after maybe an hour. It was just crazy and takes too long and just not my scene. You know, I, yeah. I, um, yeah, I like, I like hiking and walking through the woods with my dogs and, you know, I, I like me, the mu the mu I'm here for the music. You know, I remember someone in that town's Van Zant. Um, love town's Van Zant. Yeah. There was a documentary on him called, called be here to love me which oh, is which that. is yeah you probably saw that it's a great documentary and oh sweet but there was a guy that pulls up to his trailer and in my house isn't that bad but he pulls up to this trailer in houston and there's like a window broken out and you know the car is up on blocks and the guy's trying to figure out he's like am i at the right place i mean this guy wrote poncho and lefty you know there should be a lot of money coming in <laughs> And it's kind of like that with me. I got to drive a beat up pickup truck, you know, and, and um, yeah. So, um, yeah. I've but that's why the that comes through in your in your music and stuff like that too. So it must be nice for your fans to also see, okay, this guy's like living, you know, exactly the way we assume. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you're not I out think there. So. Yeah, I think that I think that definitely resonates because also, you know, you've taken I'm always interested in this kind of aspect of music, like because, you know, you I, I just saw you uh, live with Glenn and uh, you both. I always tell Glenn the same thing, but you've taken care of your voice and it's and it's one of those things where like, is that a difficult like, is there something, you know, that you have to do to maintain it? You know what I mean? Like, I'm always curious about that because I, I see some guys where I'll go back out and see them live and things have obviously changed or, or like they just don't not to despair, but like it just happens no, with yeah. age. And then there's some guys who just have this crazy laugh. Like I like Jay black before he died. Um, I remember seeing him, you know, uh, oh, yeah. like my parents, like at an oldies thing or whatever. And I was like, Oh, it'll be fun to go. Like, well, no, we don't know whatever. And he fucking like, it was like, it was yesterday. You know what I mean? Knocked that out of the park. And then, you know, Sometimes then you see these other people and they can't do it. So, but you taking care of your voice, man, you sound exactly the same. Are there any, like, you're nice to say yeah. that. <laughs> oh, dude, it's, but it's, it's like, I was like, oh, this guy has not missed a beat. It's great. I don't um, know that I take care of it. And uh, that's nice. That's, you know, I, in fact, I'm sure I don't take care of it. Um, <laughs> Cause Glenn and I were talking about that on the road. Cause he really does. He warms his voice up and, every night and he, he, you know, he's doing scales. Oh, wow. You know, he's doing, and a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, I don't do a whole lot of that and, and I smoke and I'm not a drinker, <laughs> so I don't have a whole, right. I don't have that, but I am a smoker and mm -hmm. have been for a long time. So, um, so technically I don't take good care of my, my voice at all, but, uh, so I, I think if Joan Rivers was here, she would say, you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that's, Absolutely, man. That's Genetics. It. You know, I got lucky so yeah. far and I need to quit. It's a bitch, man. You know, I know my, 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 I mean, my dad smoked up until the very last, you know, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I remember seeing him in the hospital. Uh, he was in bad shape when I, last time I saw, you know, before he passed, but, uh, but I just like in my head, I was like, I know he wants a cigarette. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah. I've been in this fucking building, you know, for so long. I'm like, I I know one of the last things he's thinking about is, can someone just hand me my pack? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You yeah. Know? I can only imagine that would be very difficult. Yeah. 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 Um, it's a bitch. It's um, it's the hardest thing, man. And and so, but I, and I've quit a bunch of times, so I'm working on it again, but. Yeah. How were, how, how were you on the road when you were, you know, uh, starting out? Like, did you avoid any kind of, like, how did you avoid the, the natural pratfalls of vices and all that other shit? Like, you is know, it just not in your life now? In the folk world, the singer songwriter world, it, it, you know, we're not talking Motley Crue. It's, it's, right. you're going to see some weed, you're going to see some drinking, but 
I never once, I don't think, saw anyone doing blow or anything like that. You know, you just won't see That's it. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And later I started, you know, I started, you know, you'll see more now, uh, not in the, not musicians, but you see more around venues now than I used to on the, on yeah. the you know, especially Northwest and just kind of like that's everywhere. And, um, it is, and I feel really bad for, for them. I don't know. Yeah. It's a, I don't even know. Yeah, they, no one knows what to do about it, you know? Oh, I know. And the amount of people that I know now, like, not even necessarily comedians. I mean, some of them, obviously, and some people that I know. But, like, the casual way in which people do coke now and say it openly is so fucking strange to me. Because when I was, a, you know, like... I was, when I was a kid, it was like this, you know, obviously this thing, like this myth or whatever the hell it was. And, like, right. you, you know, people just did it. Apart. And now they're just like, you, they just say it. And it's sort of like, oh, yeah, me and my friends, we were just coked out the other night and we went to uh, a Whataburger. And I'm just like, go back. What? what? You did like. <laughs> you did what? Yeah. You just picked some up at a fucking, you know, Starbucks. Like, where did you, like, what is going on? And I'm like, I didn't know it was yeah. a thing again. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it I never didn't either. Really, I guess it never really goes away if people people are gonna like that, you know. Exactly. I didn't. I didn't really either until when I moved out to LA. It was like the. It was actually one of the worst times of my life when I moved out to LA. That was a mistake. Um, I I thought it was gonna. You know, I had a bunch of like network meetings and all this other shit going on. I had all this other stuff booked, and then no one told me that when that dies down, you're just alone. Yeah. Uh, in what seems to be like a happy place. Like it's cause it's just 75 and sunny all the time. So you're yeah. like, and you're like, why am I depressed? The sun's out. And then you're like, Oh yeah, because this is brutal. Yeah. Um, isn't that yeah, a weird, but, isn't that a strange juxtaposition about Hollywood and LA? And, it's very weird. Um, yeah. because it is, it's like, the, it's both. And, um, and I love all of it and, and kind of, you never, never lived there, but, I think the longest I was ever there for was for a month recording. I was wow. at, the, at the old A&M studios there. And, oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of my first meetings was at uh, the, the Henson studios. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And I stayed after like, cause they were like, all right, you know, great meeting. Good seeing you. And I was like, cool. And I was like leaving. And then I took like an immediate left and then stayed on the lot. <laughs> like <laughs> you see the Charlie Chaplin stuff and all that. Oh man. Soundstage. That was cool. So fucking cool. Yeah. And yeah. the weirdest thing over there, because I guess just people, you know, they must be doing meetings. I don't know what they're doing, but Freddie Prinz was just hanging out. Um, Freddie Prinz Jr. was yeah. hanging out on the uh on the outside of the lot. And I didn't know it was him, but I had stopped to ask him directions because I couldn't figure out where to park. And then he was like, Oh, cool, man. Do you have a meeting? And then I realized it was him, and I was like, <laughs> it <laughs> just froze like an idiot. I was like, it, "Yes." I'm like, "Do they? Does Freddie Prince Jr. just greet you at the Henson Studios? This is awesome! Like, hell, it's amazing." Isn't that funny? Yeah. And you you mentioned on another episode of yours that you were talking about, and I can't remember if who who the guest was right now, but you guys were were talking about how you know even stars or people that are celebrities can get starstruck. Yeah, and it's really true, and uh, you know, no matter kind of, I've always wondered if it was because of film and TV, like the two dimensional aspect of that, and and uh, I don't know what it is. You know, I think that that just all of a sudden gives people this kind of fantasy. Yeah. You know, the the viewer or the listener, but the viewer in this case for sure, because you're here, you're seeing them. And I think, yes. And I I went through that a tiny bit, and it was weird, you know. Because you're used to not being uh, looked at, really. You know, as an artist, you're you're typically wanting to create and write and things like that, and you can yeah. it, it helps to not be observed while you're doing that. Sure. So I think that that's an interesting thing, and um, I found myself wanting to retreat away. I've known other people that really soaked it up. And I don't think yeah. that's a bad thing. I, you know. I, I think I just tend to shy away, you know, right. but I, but I always sign stuff for people and try to be kind to them, you know, and, uh, not that I have some massive following, but the fan, the fans that I do have, and they're, yeah. they're really great, you know, so are they, 
are you good about like taking photos and stuff? Do you like that kind of thing or, you know? Well, the COVID thing kind of messed that up and I stopped doing them during that, of course. Sure. I got COVID one time doing that. Pretty certain. I'm pretty certain that's how it happened was sure. I was, you know, hugging and taking pictures after the show. Um, so I do, I do it though, but <laughs> everyone, every, everyone I'm hugging that, you know, that person I'm hugging, you know, I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> yep. And they, and they don't see, like, I swear to God, some people literally go out of their way to breathe in your mouth and you're like, are you fucking joking? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Could you take a couple steps back? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And alcohol typically is involved, you know, so it's after the yeah. show. You know, I have n I've had nothing to drink. They've had three or four drinks, you know. So oh, so man. sometimes, though, I, after my shows, I, I'm not up for it. You know, I know that yeah. I'm, I know that I won't give them. I I think I've I've and Glenn and I are both like that. We were talking about that. That if you can't give them, like if you can't make eye contact, listen to their stories, because mm -hmm. a lot of times they want to talk to you. Yes, and, absolutely. And give you uh, their story, right? So if you're not mm -hmm. able to do that, just don't go out. Right. That's what I do. Agreed. You know, if I'm yeah. pretty, if I've had a bad show, I'm not going to be able to take a compliment well, you know, and all that. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I feel you. We, you know, uh, I was saying before, Joanne and I, that when we go out to do shows, we literally have developed a signal with each other we're like if we want to leave we just kind of like do you know like touch it like do one of these or or one of us will come up to the other and go are you do we need to go to that we we have to get out of here we got to go to that thing <laughs> right. and then we just fucking like pretend like whatever because it is like you know we look, you're right like if you have a bad show you do not want to talk to people afterward or there's like those people who want to give you their advice or like oh i tried doing stand-up back in 1980 and you're like guy right. i don't have the fucking patience <laughs> Yeah. So, you yeah. Know. I wrote I wrote a song one time. <laughs> you, that, you know, I get that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, did you so when you was there anybody else in your family who was uh, musically inclined? Like what was your like trajectory into like who got you into this? Yeah, they were all kind of musical. Um Very cool. My grandfather was an upright bass player and bass horns played big band music and concert band music, played polka. He could play a oh, lot of, wow. a lot of different music. And, um, but big band was his main, main thing. And, mm -hmm. and so my mom, his, his, you know, was his daughter. She, uh, she could play piano and sing. And, um, my dad never pursued it like an instrument, but he could sing just naturally. Wow. Um, I remember hearing him, he'd have him a couple of drinks and then he had this huge bass voice, like, wow. like an octave deeper than mine, you know, just this massive. And he would sing, uh, you know, when the moon hits your eye, like a big pizza pie. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, we were, and my brother taught me to play guitar and, um, and, uh, he's older, he's about six years older and took me to all the cool concerts when, when I was growing up, you know, he took me to see ELO and Queen and um, really, really good shows, you know, and uh, yeah. taught me to play my first four or five songs on the guitar, you know, kind of got me into it. So Nice. Yeah. So then, like, when you were decided to go into music, there were no objections? Like, no one was like, you need to stick it out and, and, and get a backup job? Or, like, were they just naturally supportive? Well, my dad was pretty keen on all of us going to college he he had not okay. gone he had not gone to college and so it had become this thing in his own mind that his three kids are going to go to college sure. and um so we all kind of did did that and i think when i look back on it i think i did do it for him in a way but i enjoyed it enjoyed the experience anyway um i actually i actually went to a military college in north georgia which is, oh, wow. uh, yeah, it's an army-based uh, ROTC program that's kind of five days a week, basically. It's a, it's an everyday ROTC. You live it, and it's army-based. And I probably needed that. Uh, I was kind of on, kind of on my way, uh, you 
know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew music was part of what I wanted to do, but I had trouble just kind of staying out of trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that I almost joined the military. And instead of doing that, I went to college and I was, I'm glad I did. And, and nice. I became a music major there and, um, and a tiny little place called North Georgia, uh, state university cool. not as big or not as small now it's grown quite a bit but um yeah and so th- th- my dad though wasn't keen on it you know he he wanted me to be a teacher because that's what i went to college to do um, so that was your other passion was teaching yeah i i wouldn't i wish i could say it was a passion um mm-hmm. it was something that i would have been willing to do right and, right now at this point I've gotten to teach quite a bit just doing songwriter workshops and nice. things like that. And I love it. So I think I would have really enjoyed doing that if I had to, do it, you know, and, uh, yeah, but I, you know, I wanted to give this a shot. I wanted to get out yeah. there and try to, I, I didn't know how it was going to pan out, but <laughs> you know. right. Yeah. And that's the exciting part though, too. Like, I, I don't know. Um, I almost feel bad for people kind of coming up, exactly now and then i see how well they're good at sticking their faces in front of a camera and i'm like they're gonna be fine yeah. but like I, there, there's something about like you know i mean i i was lucky enough to to come up like when you when you did just have to go to open mics and you still got that experience of like you know we don't know how this is gonna go nobody knows what's going on this is all kind of you know fresh or whatever uh right so it wasn't all online yet but i i kind of like you know, listening to all the people that came before me when they're like, yeah, you'll, you're going to remember this kind of stuff, you know what I mean? And, and like driving to the gig in the middle of nowhere and all that other shit, you're like, oh, okay. Oh yeah. So it's it, right. You know, you do remember all that stuff. It's fun. Yeah. We were talking about it on tour. Glenn and I, we were, we were saying, uh, cause you know, for the most part you can on your phone, you can get at least to the front of the club or venue you're playing now. Yeah. Okay. And, now, and if you have in, some good directions about where to load in, okay, there's an alleyway and you got to go down this street. Okay. Well, I think back to mm-hmm. 1994. Yeah. Or even 1999 for that matter. But 94, I've got a Ram McNally ma- map that's one of those massive ones you would get at Walmart or whatever. Yeah. And, and that's it. There were, there yeah. No cell phone. I'm like, so if I'm going, I'm lost all the time anyway. Like, I'm terrible with directions. Me too. Yeah, me too. Oh, it's terrible. Horrible. Yeah. I was so bad at land navigation in the Army that I almost failed the whole course because of my land navigation. Wow. The, it was terrible. I got, I finally got good at it, but I had to really practice. <laughs> but, uh, Could you? Did you ever do that where you imagine like what it would have been like if people like way back in the day when shit was really important had our ailments or allergies or skill level where there's like, we're going to charge that hill and then it's the wrong fucking, you know what I mean? Like just that slight, like how do they all know? <laughs> They're so good at it. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, and I, and in that particular case, it made me think of, of like civil war history, which I enjoy a lot. And, um, and, uh, they didn't always show up where they wanted to or, or at the time they wanted to, and they still don't. Yeah. All. And it's still, as far as infantry level, you know, of course we have the technology and stuff that, uh, it's beyond belief. But when you get down to that kind of foot soldier level, still, uh, there are timing issues that, that, that are always a problem, I think still. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I always think like if I was a caveman, you know, cause I, I always, I have to take allergy medicine like every day. And then I was like, but I just can't imagine like, you know, my tribe coming and be like, come on, man, we're going to go hunting. And I'm like, yeah, I got this sinus thing. <laughs> I can't really, you know, you know, I'm allergic to Buffalo, you know, and they'd be like, just kill him. Yeah. Why are we supporting this guy? <laughs> they would have, they would have eaten you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly i've just been spit roasted over a fire like what are we you know done yeah i was just crazy. watching um a documentary on on the theory anyway that oh. that whole area of 
Chaco Can Canyon, uh, that that area that's probably uh, they disappeared around fifteen hundred years ago, but right. but they found a lot of human bones in the same way that they find human bones that have been eaten in other places. And oh, it's the first time that, that they, they're talking about this. And, and it's causing some issues because Native Americans don't like that, of course. Right. Um, and, uh, but it's an interesting theory. And it's yeah. w what they ended up thinking might have happened was Aztecs came up from Mexico and they were already doing those, those practices, a lot, of, sure. a lot of human sacrifice and some can cannibalism. And right. that they might have gone up to that Arizona and New Mexico as far up as there and conquered those areas. So, but that kind of stuff blows my mind. I, I find it all fascinating and people are crazy. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I, I always watch those, those are the type of documentaries I watch like late at night yeah. where I'm just like, it's like, I'm finally, no one else is going to bother me. It's like two o'clock in the morning and I'm like, we did what to each other? <laughs> You know, that you pass out and have dreams about it. Yeah, it's wild. I know. I mean, it's the human race is nuts, man. We always have been. You know, it's. Yeah. People forget that we're animals and that's the kind of shit that used to happen. And, and you know, uh, I, I remember, um, you know, when you find out from school that they're just lying to you about colonization and Native America. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know, they tell you they tell you, like, everybody was fine and we ate corn. Right. <laughs> it was like a big, and then like you know you find out they're full of shit and you're like oh my god no this was yeah. brutal it to took, and i didn't know a different history until i read howard zinn's you know people's history of the united yeah. states which was i was probably 24 years old so yeah. I, I didn't i didn't have a clue and i went to hear him speak wow and bought the book there and uh, I was like, wow, this is, this is really something, you know? Yeah. Right. But I get it. I think every, every civilization and country, they write their own history. I think that's. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah that's what. Absolutely. I mean, just look at the way it's so funny when you think about like everything is a microcosm of something else. So you're like, yeah, of course the, the you know, uh, our, our country wrote it's wrote, you know, altered history. Whatever. Like, we get our text altered in the press on a small, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, how many times have we given like an interview for something or whatever and they oh, fuck yeah. us, you know, and you're just like, that's not anything that I would have said or said before. Or, right. You right. know, or they, or they describe you in a really unflattering way when you, they're like, he walked in the door with a sullen look at him. Like, go fuck yourself, guy. I'm, you know, it, it's windy. I'm tired. It's 9 a.m. You know, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. Kinder. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. It's like that Bill Hicks thing where his face, he would say people would always come up to him and go, what's wrong? <laughs> Dude, you know, I just did a gig in DC and this is, you know, this is just funny in and of itself, but so, you know, you, you advert, you know, when you advertise a gig, like you, what you, you know, your poster, what you look like on the poster is you literally your best self, but you know, my, hopefully. Joanne and I, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. And Joanne and I got there and you know, it was a hell of a drive, man. You know, DC it's four hours. You hit traffic. We, we are, we had a problem with our hotel. There was some shit going on. Of course. You know, and, yeah. And then, you know, and then we went out to go grab something to eat, but the wind at the time was not so my hair is like insane. And then, you know, we go do, I tried to fix it. It didn't work. I was like, fuck it. This is what I look like. I'm going downstairs. So, <laughs> and of course, by the way, so you'll love this. The, this is the first time I've been, I've been doing this club for like eight years. This is the first time they bought an in-house photographer. And I'm like, are you fucking joking me? Right. So he's like, hey, man, he's got the cameras around his neck. And, and he's like, you know, we're, we're going to be taking your picture tonight. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. And I meet this guy. We're talking, you know, whatever. He's like, I can't wait to see your show. He leaves. And then he comes back in. And like a, like five minutes later, and he, and he walks over to me and he goes, so are you, who, who are you again? And I thought he was fucking around. And I was like, Dude, like I just told, like I'm, I'm the headliner. He goes, "Oh my god, I'm so sorry." He goes, "You, your hair looks so different from the posters. It's so put together in the." And I was like, "Fuck you, guy!" Like, whatever. <laughs> he had a twin brother. He has a twin brother that he neglected to tell us about. So when he left, his twin came in and was like, "Who are you?" And I was like, "What the fuck?" 
is going on. So I just used it when I was on stage. But oh, yeah, I was great. like, he's right. I do look like the dude who gave Jenny AIDS and Forrest got like, I'm like, I'm, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I look like shit right now. I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, it's, oh my God. That's so <laughs> it's a rough funny. night. Um, but yeah, it's so like, it's that is so, so, so funny. funny. <laughs> yeah, you just don't know. Oh my God. Oh, That's great, yeah. man. It was a hell of a weekend, man. We had a, uh, you know, it, it just, it's one of those things where you're having a blast on stage and all the photos that were taken and, and whatever you wind up posting does not reflect the literal hell you experienced in right. between any of it, yeah. you know? And, and the worst part is sometimes you do these things and you're like, why are you guys even doing this to us? You're paying me <laughs> to be here. Like, right. I'm, I'm not losing money. You're, lo you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's, if you guys want to give me a hard time, it's weird, but. You're talking about uh, yeah. audience, like when audience, like, uh, not, not even the audience. It literally was a club situation. The audiences I gotcha. were fine, I gotcha. but like the amount of fuck ups the venue had done, I gotcha. like just in succession. And you're like, yeah, what are you, what is everybody doing? Like, I mean, I know what I'm doing, but I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Oh man. Um, Hey, when you, so when you go, go ahead, ahead, go ahead. No, 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 because I was going to say one of the cool, I didn't know this at all. So when you were in high school, and this may be one of those things that you read on the internet and it's totally wrong. So just correct me, obviously. But did you, you were, you went to high school with Amy Ray? So I didn't go to the same high school. She, okay. They went to a rival high school of ours, but oh. the same area. But, um, okay. But I did meet her when I was in about, I think it was the ninth grade. And, she was at her first year at Emory. So she, cause they're about four years older than me. Okay. Um, and yeah, she came and played some songs at my school for one of my classes I was in. And, um, yeah, I just totally dug it and we got to know each other and I'd start to go see them play. They weren't even called Indigo girls yet. They were called sailors and Ray. Oh, wow. And uh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, and they both have always been really just supportive and great people and, you know, talk, well, they walk the walk big time, you know, they're yeah, and uh, good role models. And, and, and so, yeah, that, yeah, they were a bit, they kind of were a muse in a way for me, kind of just, you know, a wing to be under letting me open shows over the years or, you know, oh, giving me I remember Amy gave me a list of places to play, like when I first started. Wow. You know, she, she gave me names, phone numbers, of all the club owners. Of course, now that, that's when your work really starts. You have to start calling them. But, but yeah. the fact, though, that she would share the information, on, you know, that's the kind of scene it was. So, Right. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I love hearing about that kind of stuff because I don't think, you know, I think it's kind of something that's missing now. And I think it's because um, you're not in front of people as much as you were before. A lot of what we're a lot of what everybody's doing now is just involved with clicks and online and, and like trying to whatever. So you miss that connection of like, you know, there's not so many doors you can open on the Internet when you're fighting an algorithm. But there is a door if you know a club owner or whatever. Right. And I, I always wanted to kind of put together these stories because that's that's phenomenal that somebody was, you know, that she was there and gave you a list because I had the same help when I was starting out, too. They were just these guys, you know, who if they liked you or you reminded them of yourself or whatever the hell it is, they would be like, I'm going to make, you know, here's a list or I'm going to make a phone call or drop my name. Mm -hmm. And it feels good to do. And also, it's just like, it's good to have that kind of camaraderie and community because it can carry you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. For a while. And it's necessary to, to keep kind of passing the torch to, I try to, in my own way, do that too. And, um, but yeah, Amy was great. I mean, she's always been that way. She, you know, if anything, she can be, she can be tough, you know, she can be, yeah, yeah. yeah if she, I remember I wasn't going to even return any calls from the labels at first mm -hmm. i was like i'm not returning it. you know i want to be indie totally independent right you know like you know like andy defranco or jello biafra or that, that's what i want to do and i remember her going mm -hmm. you should at least you know listen to what they have to say <laughs> <laughs> that's great though and she's pretty I... indie minded you know like but yeah but uh yeah, I mean, she had, she was, and I ended up with, you know, with their, their manager, 
a guy named Russell Carter, and I've been with him all those years. And uh, oh, great! I'm kind of the num. I'm probably the number two or three kind of in that roster. You know, they're the they're the main the main thing, so they they get most of the attention. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's freaking awesome, though. I they I was so bummed, man. They were here in you. You played Asbury Park, right? Yeah, it's been a long time. Been yeah, a long time. I, I, that's where my friends. I mean, like it's. You know, that's where we went and hung out. And we were, I mean, I still, I, I, I done stand up okay. there, I just, you know, and all that other stuff, but uh, you know, stone pony and stuff like that is like, but, and they were there, they were going to be there, but I had a gig and I couldn't go to the thing. And I was like, this is fucking bullshit. Like, when are they going to be, you know, it, it's, it's people don't often pass through this area for some reason. I don't, you know, I mean, I know Jersey sucks, but Jesus Christ, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, God damn. I always liked playing coastal New Jersey and there's also that place this, and I don't know if they're doing it still, but it was in Stanhope, New Jersey called the Stanhope house. Oh yeah. 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 That was a cool venue, man. It was, yeah, you know, very cool. and kind of a, you know, supper club blues venue kind of vibe. But, um, yeah, I used to play the saint back in the old days <sighs> and yeah, I maybe stone. I might've played stone pony. I don't recall right now, but, yeah, I typically, you know, I'll play one show somewhere in Jersey and one, you know, like show in downtown in New York and um, typically kind of get on out, you know, and head. Yeah. I w it used to be that I would spend a week in New York playing all the little places when I first started because I didn't have yeah. a following yet and no, no one cared if I played, you know, three or four times in the same week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So I would do like the bitter end and Shanae and end, yeah. CB's gallery, all those places. And, um, but yeah. Yeah. So I first started in 89 is when I first started trying to record a record and get out there and play. I was still in college, but I was kind of, you know, halfway kind of had my foot halfway out the door. Have you, has your music changed like in how you approach writing it or whatever? Like, are you a, do you, do you hear like melody first and then lyrics or do you just work on your lyrics first and then the tune comes later? Like how, what's your process like? Um, that's all, that all has changed a few times over the years. I think I've tried a lot of different things. Um, the most natural, easy thing is to follow a melody and chord progression. So, uh, and then to write to it. But okay. that's also becomes, it, it's easier in the sense that it's natural, like for me to hear melody and to hear, mm -hmm. and hear a chord structure with it. So it's sure. more natural. What makes it hard though, is now you're having to stuff whatever lyrics you come up with. You have to make sure they're the right lyrics to fit in those exact notes, you know, and those, <sighs> and, and so that makes it, in that approach, in my opinion, can sometimes make lyric writing much harder than yeah. if, if you were to start with a lyric and then uh, start to hear as you're writing the lyric. Sometimes a melody will start to fall in place while you're writing the lyric, which is for me the best way, because then I'm already concentrating on what I want to say with words, but that melody right. is starting to sink in too. I never thought of it that way, that you actually have to squeeze in the lyrics if you write the melody first. Like, Well, you have to, kind of maybe, I mean, or you have to figure out what you're saying then, you know? So, right. so it always, I mean, there are, obviously there are writers that are, that's what they do. They, someone gives them melody. Uh, it'd be like the opposite of Elton John and Bernie Taupin where. Sure. If Elton gave Bernie the music first and then, he wrote the lyrics to it you know that would have been much more difficult i think sure. than having the lyrics given to you and you go okay because even he's told me that, that he had to move things around a little bit mm -hmm. even as the a finished lyric he would get it and then he would go okay this is a chorus here so this will repeat and then i'll take this section here and make it a bridge but i'm gonna have to move it you know, two thirds up into the song, but it's still gonna, it's gonna wow. work, but it always worked. So it was like one of those oh, cool, awesome. yeah, it was a beautiful match in that sense, you know, like. When did you meet Elton? I met him through Ed Roland of Collective Soul. Oh, um, no way. And I've known, That's awesome. known Ed for a long time and, and um, 
he was really good friends with Elton. So I was recording and Ed was in the studio and I said, um, Hey man, I've been wanting to do this Elton John song called border song. And I wonder, uh, I know, you know him and he goes, yeah, I know him. He, 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 I said, do you think he would come and play on it? And he goes, man, he'll play on it, sing on it, whatever you want. He, he said, no one ever, wow. he said, no one ever asks him. Wow. And man. so we all went out to dinner and, and sure enough, he was like, I, you know, absolutely. When you want me to come in, you know, and I gave him a yeah. date, gave him the date. He was there and so much fun. He was. Holy shit. That's was, incredible. Yeah. We hung out for several hours and I never really. I've always been the kind of guy that doesn't follow up well with, with those kind of that level, that, yep. that a list level, you know, and I've met a bunch of them and yep. I've, I've never been the guy that kind of is going to be calling them over and over. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I, it is, it is. I talk to uh, people I meet in the business about this ad nauseum because I'm always trying to hopefully uh, I'm trying to glean something off of somebody who has like a nugget of advice or like the secret and no one does. None of us do. We're all awkward. And, you know, yeah, um, it's it's weird. And and once in a while, you'll run across someone that the connection's really there. That's what it has, yes. it has to be there. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, I had this weird, you know, like Mel Gibson and um, I'm sure you living out there, you've got a ton of these crazy stories. But yeah. I, I remember Mel Gibson and what was what's her name? She's, she was in uh, Last of the Mohicans and uh, um, just I'll look it up right now. Um, and she was in that movie with him. The uh, We Were Soldiers. Anyway, uh, oh, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't believe I can't I'm, think of her name. On her name. Um, it's it's uh, Terry Russell. No, not not Terry Russell. Oh, Madeline Stowe. That's it. Madeline Stowe. Madeline Stowe. Yeah. So Madeline came to see me just and Carrie Russell at a concert I was doing in Columbus, Georgia. And mm. they just happened to be hanging out. Right. So I, yeah. I go and do a show and they came up and were real nice and, they said, "Hey, come to the shoot tomorrow. We're they're shooting a film there on the base, on like on on, on the yeah. army post." And it was that movie we were we were soldiers, and uh, so I ended up going and watching them do the thing, and it was kind of cool to watch them shoot a movie. And then we all went out to dinner afterwards, and and uh, and you know everyone had a few drinks, and um, Mel's driving the SUV, and we're all in an SUV. All of a sudden, my wife at the time uh, and Madeline Stowe, they both got up on top of the SUV while it was driving. Holy shit. And this is in a, this is like in a neighborhood in, in Columbus, Georgia with cobblestone streets. It's really old and all these like colonial houses. It's really weird. <laughs> but right. they both get on top of that. They're both on top of the SUV, like hooting and hollering and having a ball up there. Right. And I'm I'm in the back seat and Mel Gibson turns to me and he's like, Man, I don't even have my license with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. He, he, he goes, You need to can you get him down from there? You know, he's like I'm like, I'm trying to get him down, you know, and it was this crazy just twenty minutes of craziness and I was like, Well, this is Hollywood right here, man. This is like so what you get when you hang uh, out with these people. Absolutely. Funny. That is fucking hilarious, dude. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. I love moments like that, man. Cause they're surreal. And it's one of those things where you're like, is anybody honestly going to believe me? Yeah. <laughs> like most, when I, you most, know. People, most people don't. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Only when you have those other shared experiences, then it gives it like a thing. It's so funny too, like what you said about, you know, like, like you're hanging out with Mel Gibson again and like, whatever, like I've had people who are like, you know, like Mel Brooks or like anybody like where they're like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, you got my number, keep it. Or like a George slot or whatever. And I'm like, yeah. And then I walk away and go, now what do I, you know what I mean? Like, do I text them now, later, after right. I get in the car, a week from now, do they think I, you know, and it's yeah. just like, <laughs> it, it's so funny. Like my brain just explodes. 
I had um, early on, like one of the first few episodes, I had Megan Cavanaugh on from League of Their Own. Right, right. And, uh, yeah. And so, and she and I had become good friends, but the funniest thing in the world was she was talking to me about um, the same thing, the regret of like all these people she's worked with in the movies and that she just fucking never kept in touch with because she's too whatever. And so I go, I'm the same way, you know, I've yeah. met comedians, like bigger comedians over the years and it's really hard to do that. And I, and then towards the end of the thing, she was like, well, keep in touch. And I go, do you, f I'm like, are we going to do this? <laughs> Like because I will. And Are she was like, serious? no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's like, no, 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 no. I swear to God. And so now we're just like locked into this. Like, you know, we text each other every now and again. Or like, definitely on the holidays. <laughs> That's great. Like, I still get that thing of like, like I was, you know, like, I don't know. It, it, the, the weirdest thing is, is like forgetting, you know, when, you, when you're a fan of somebody else, you forget that you're still in this bit. Like, I forget that I've been doing this for almost two decades because I meet people that I, you know, again not just like yourself like people that i like especially for music industry stuff like your your music like glenn's like everybody like you don't understand like i remember being on the hood of a car you know in hot like listening to all the shit so that shaped my whole life you know i mean there's there's just stuff like that that is ingrained in in my dna in my friend's dna we have all these memories right yeah and then but to say like you know like i was talking to uh uh you know, one of my friends, uh, you know, the Gin Blossoms just did the um, Robin and and Scott did uh, the benefit this year. Yeah. And they played uh, they played six songs, which is crazy. You know what I mean? Like, a, like it's hard enough to do things streaming as you know, how we <laughs> are time getting in today. But, you know, they got to do that thing. But like the 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 ask is the craziest thing. And I and, I, and, it, and it comes together every year. But every year when I put that thing together, I am like paranoid as shit yeah like asking people to do stuff because yeah. you know like one it's never going to get into my head that they enjoy doing it it's never going to get into my head that they enjoy you know being with me on the thing or whatever it's just it's a i was like my friend was like you're just gonna have to get used to dealing with that that fucking neurotic shit because it's not going away <laughs> it's like <sighs> yeah i mean i i would hope that it could but but I, <laughs> I but I think you're probably right or your friend was probably right, because I think it gets ingrained. And if you don't change it by a certain time, it's hard to know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe a certain psychedelic would help. Oh, that would be lovely. I've been you know, it's funny as the, the older I get, the more I think about, like, will this cure me? Right. Sure. <laughs> me, yeah. or I'm like. I've been avoiding it for this long. Maybe if I just popped one, it'd be fine. And right. I'd be, you know, I, you know, reading about, especially when you're talking about Bill Hicks, man, anytime I reread like one of his books or like his experiences with it, I'm yeah. like, man, that sounds fucking The whole awesome. sque sque squeegeeing your third eye and all that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> when he talks about the ride, the you know ride. what I mean? I'm like, ah, oh, man, yeah. come on. That, can't beat that shit. Yeah, the good news that story, the positive news yeah. story. Oh, God, yeah. There's, uh, I want to bring it back to writing and stuff like that real quick too, because yeah. there's, uh, so like, you know, for, for a song like Lullaby, was it fully, cause, okay. Cause I know the story behind it and you know, whatever, but that seemed to come together for you. You know what I mean? Like, um, how often does something like that happen with songwriting and story writing where you're like it, you know, it's just kind of, you see something, you experience it and then it's kind of fully formed. Um, not that often, really. When I look back on the hundreds of things that have been written, right? It's probably, you know, five to ten percent at the most. Because most of the time, okay. yeah, I wish it was different. I wish that they were always popping, and I think for some people they do. I think once in, I think that's sure. genius. I think that's when that that's that's when you got genius is when they're always, um coming and they're they're coming as, as fast as as you can ride it that's they're coming you know or mm -hmm. at least to some degree you know i think because for me it's once in a while you know once every 50 songs or something i feel like sure. one will just whew, you know yeah and the rest of them it's like uh, either very hard labor or somewhere in between where you know you like there's right. one song I've literally been working on for six years now. 
Wow. And and I just don't, you know, it, it finally really started to come together uh, over the last few months. But mm -hmm. I still, and that's lyrics first. And uh, it's kind of a somewhat, I, I'd like to say, in the, I think it's about the fentanyl thing is what it seems to be. It's, cool. it's a story song, but I feel like it's a... Um, a bit of a metaphor in a way or a set of them. And, and so I think that's what, but it's taken forever. It's like this. Right. And then, and I'm just letting it be what it is and, um, not, not trying to rush it. You know? Yeah. But, and, and you, but you can do that kind of stuff too, because one, it's a piece of your work and it means something to you and you'll know and hate it. If you put something out, that's yeah. not, you know, that's unfinished. I mean, it's the same. I've gone back through older notebooks and like, found a joke that didn't work or that I was still, you know, that was just dating. Sometimes you, you, you rethink a stuff in your head or you find it and you're like, how, how have I been doing it this way for so long? Like a moron yeah. when I could have just, it was an easy fix. Like it, it's, it's, you know, but that's part of the gene, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm sure it, it's genius if you're just writing all the time too, and it's just coming to you. But also I think part of that genius is being able to hone it and know when to put something out and when not to put it out too. Well, like that's yeah. Part of the, yeah, I mean, there are definitely people that put out whatever they're coming up with, which isn't always great. Right. There's that. Like, I'm a massive Prince fan, for instance. But yeah. If, but, and, and I've heard some stuff from Prince that I was like, yeah, okay. But, <laughs> but then there's, yeah. then there are all these masterpieces, right? So I think yeah. he's one of those examples, you know, or, um, but there were not a lot of them out there. And, and I think, uh, I think it's just most of us, you know, we get lucky once in a while is what it gets down to. You get lucky. Everything sure. falls into place. Um, I was, luck is right. you know, the, yeah, I do. I do. And whatever that means, if it's timing, or, sure. um, I just feel like, cause I remember the song I was listening to when the melody came for lullaby, mm -hmm was uh sunny came home by sean colvin oh yeah that's a great song so that chorus i was driving in the desert in in california that chorus is in my head that somehow i start singing that and going okay mm -hmm. we'll listen to that you know and i think after a little while i'm playing around with the falsetto and my voice and the flipping and that's what all she was doing She's just right. a female, but she's still doing this falsetto flip or this head voice flip, kind of a yodel yeah. style that she does. And that's how that melody came. It was really kind of um, not borrowing because it's nothing like that melody, but it's obviously for me, I can remember that, you know, I can remember going. Sure. And then, and then the Joni Mitchell affecting the way I made the guitar and, and also Ani DeFranco. And so, and then the rest of it's just me telling the story. So, and I think it's just all kind of come together and there, a couple of things have happened like that for me, you know, but that one was the biggest one. <laughs> so. Yeah, man. Well, like, are you good at walking away from stuff when you're like, cause you know, for, I mean, you can always change it when you're on the road and like kind of tune stuff and, oh, yeah. and fit stuff in. But like when you have a project and it's gotta be done and you gotta print it in the CDs, you know, like the music's coming out or yeah. the album's coming out. How good are you at going? That's it. Like it's, yeah. it's a finished product that I got to walk away. Well, the team, you know, I always make sure I'm with really good engineers. There, I've got great, mm. great guys. Sometimes co-producers um, or a, or a producer that I'm not. I'm gonna be more hands off. Like I've done that before. Um, yeah, yeah. I tend to know. I I tend to. I can I can tell when we're going too far. Okay. Yeah, I'll go. Okay, that's too much. You know, right. let's go the other way. You know, with something. Uh, to me, like less is more a lot with production. So, um, mm. and also just kind of the way things, uh, the way things are laid out, kind of in the sound and the spectrum. You know, are you hearing it? Right. Are you hearing it deeply, or is it kind of flat? all those kind of things. And, and I, that's the stuff I'm really paying attention to. Um, and I tend to know pretty quickly if things are going in the direction that I don't want, you know, right. I, I tend to get, know what I want 
which is interesting. <laughs> that's great, though. If you can, if that's, oh, my God, that's so half the battle. <laughs> More than half. Like, yeah, I, I'm. It doesn't always, always end up what I up. thought, though. I mean. Right. I, but it, but it'll end up better sometimes, you know. Right, right. Oh, that's great. That's you know, great sometimes it, by by driving through what I think is right, something else might happen that I need to go ahead and accept. Mm -hmm. You know, as a part of this, because it did it did make it better, or you know, the base part I was thinking isn't the part. You know, it, it's yeah. you know, um, like I heard. Uh, Bass parts are very interesting. I'm very picky about my bass parts, and I don't play, okay. I don't even really play the bass, but I just know I just love bass. Yeah, and you know, like that Wallflowers song, one headlight. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's got that that kind of almost um, trotting style bass that's going doom da da doom da da doom da da doom. That's what the bass is yeah. doing. A boom, yeah. But a boom, but a boom, but a boom, but a boom, and it wouldn't sound like that if the bass part didn't do that. If it went boo doo do 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 do, just a straight rock, you know, right. it it wouldn't have this this really cool uh, groove. And yeah. I I heard a version of it where they were playing it live, and it was much faster, and the and the bass player wasn't doing that thing. He was playing kind of straight eights, and it it didn't groove right. the same way. So it's interesting, you know. I. I would I would have never thought I don't know why they did it that way but one time at least they did. Um, yeah. They just tr probably were just trying it differently, you know. Sure, yeah. absolutely. You know it's it's one of those things that I think is so funny too because I, you know, you know, comedians can change stuff up all the time. You do whatever you got to do whatever and then most people want to hear the same songs. And I think probably, you know, uh I don't I don't do you, I don't know if you know Adam Durrett from the Counting Crows or any of those guys but like my I've gone to see them do you know them? I don't. I I got to play with the guitar mandolin guy one time on a record of mine, but and I can't remember his nice. name. Nice. I don't know Adam though. No. Oh, it's um. So one of the things, like my friends and I just went to see. They're they're big uh, dashboard fans, and I, you know, I love the Count of Crows. So we went to go see them live, and then they were like, and and they know the Count of Crows. You know, we all again, we all grew up on that music. But I was like secretly joyful because I know when you go see the Counting Crows live, Adam, for some reason, will not play Mr. Jones or anything else the way you know it and love it. So everybody around me is trying to sing along and they oh, can't great. because he's just fucking, you know, <laughs> and they're like, what is this? And I'm dying. But like, it, and I get it because the first time yeah. I went when I was a kid, I was like, he's not doing the fucking thing. Like, <laughs> you're like, oh. I guess he's bored. I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know why he's doing it. But, That's great. And it's so funny. Like, I was just like watching everybody like, oh, wait till you fucking get to the, you know. At, least he, he, does at least he plays the hit, though. And and I've always played it, too. But the thing, one time I didn't. And I learned uh, the hard way. Um, we were in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. At some little disco club. It was really weird. And I was in an RV at the time. I remember I was touring in an RV. And we played the show and kicked ass. I mean, it was a, such a good show. Mm -hmm. And, but at that time, and a lot of times, I end a show, I'll leave the stage and then come back and do the big hit, right? That's nice. one, one way to do it. And, sure. and and I was doing it that way on that tour. And so we, we did Beautiful Wreck or another one and then left the stage and the crowd dies down to us to like a silence. They, they don't call us back out. So I look at the other guys and I'm like, well, shit, I guess they don't want to hear the. The big hit, the big hit. They're not going to call us back out. It'd be weird to walk out with no crowd going. Right. Yeah, we're going back to the RV. So we get on the RV and the next thing we know, the crowd is outside and they've surrounded the RV and they're shaking it. Oh, shit. And I can hear people going, sign my wife's T-shirt, Bubba. <laughs> and shit like that. <laughs> and I'm terrified. And, oh my god and the club owner comes on the bus and he's like you know i didn't get my song you know you're not getting paid 
and then, and I've got this tour manager that's like seven foot tall and weighs 300 pounds. So he's ready mm. to pick up the guy and shake the change out of his pocket, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it, oh, that's it great. Was just one of those nights. And it was the only time I've never played the song. And of course I would have played it, but it was yeah. one of those misunderstandings that happened between audience and performer. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Oh my God. That is fucking wild. I love that they didn't like anticipate, uh, um, you know, an encore. That's hilarious to me. They just went straight from he's gone to rage. Yeah. And it, it, it becomes <laughs> to, to the thing where it, it became the thing where I was like, well, they just don't get it. And, <laughs> and then it's like, well, maybe I don't get it. Maybe I'm the one yeah. that doesn't get it. <laughs> right, right. Somebody, yeah, maybe <laughs> somebody didn't get it, and uh, yeah, it was Fucking weird. Crazy. Yeah, nothing against Shreveport; it's a great town, but no, no, yeah. Do you? I mean, this is something that I think is again. This is like my music nerd inside of me, and all that other stuff. But like, do you reflect on like the fact that like y that period of time is like because uh, the way sometimes the way I think of music is like. You know, people now are always like, God, why are people so obsessed with like 80s, 90s, nostalgia, like seven, whatever the hell it is, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, because those were the impactful 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, impactful decades. So much shit happened. So much change happened. So much music happened. Right. You know, I mean, like 40s, like whatever. No one gives it. Like, I remember watching a documentary with um, Scorsese did with Ann Leibowitz. Mm. And she was like, you know, I don't rem because She goes, you want to know why I know those the decades that we grew up in and everything like that were more important than you know whatever she goes because i don't remember anybody running up to my parents and going hey what was it like in the 30s like <laughs> like because no, you know what was me you know tell us about those times so like right but like it you sucks. guys are all, like the 30s they, really <laughs> the 30s really really fucking suck <laughs> exactly I think. like yeah wouldn't you imagine i mean god even here like sometimes you know it's it's so funny i'll play video games where like if they want to scare the shit out of you in the game they'll just have you'll just have you walk into a room with a record from the 30s playing and you're like i'm about to get murdered like this, <laughs> this is like this is the worst fucking shit i've ever heard in my life something bad's gonna happen did you um, did you watch um bates motel oh, oh, bates, yes oh my god yeah i love great i love the use of older music and the wardrobe too. her wardrobe and all that i thought that was oh so good yeah anything anything scratchy on a super old record with like that that kind of like every little dream you know like whatever you're like mm -hmm. holy shit some stuff's about to so like yeah um but yeah but like that that decade that you guys all came out of like and everything like that like does it resonate with you man do you feel it do you feel like the the impact that you know like feel, all of you had coming out of it. Well, I've always felt like I was in the wrong decade. Oh wow! Yeah, I've always it's and that's my fault for feeling that way, obviously. But yeah, I mean, I felt like my thing would have been late sixties, early seventies. It would have been it would have worked out better, and because I wasn't a band really, and there and there were other singer songwriters, obviously, but there, mm -hmm. there were a shit ton of bands though. You know, it was like. Yeah. The whole modern rock '90s alternative thing was a lot of bands and um, a lot of yarling, you know, kind of a lot of that kind of singing. <laughs> and, uh, but <laughs> absolutely. But but when I good. but when I think back on it, it, it's kind of better than what some of what's going on now. Which seems, I don't know. It's like there's no testosterone in some of the male vocals I hear now. It's like, right. You know, it was, it went from the nineties being kind of ultra, um, that to almost everyone kind of, <laughs> yeah, a lot of wispy shit. <laughs> yeah. Every, and, uh, and the pronunciation of the words kind of, I don't know. It's very weird. So, but like yep. I still listen. I'll I'll try to listen and kind of take in what's going on. And there's some great stuff out there. My yeah. uh, one of my dear friends' daughter is so good, and she's starting to make a real splash in Nashville, actually. Um, oh, nice. Named Kira. What's her name? Kira Cannon. Kira. Kira Cannon. Cool. Kira Cannon, and she's just really, really great, and um, just gets it, you know, like get, awesome. Yeah, and uh. But yeah, there's always, I was talking about it with someone yesterday that 
they were saying there's so much crappy music now. And I'm like, man, there's always been crappy music. Yeah. I can promise you that there were during the seventies and eighties, nineties, sixties, fifties, forties, all of those masterful hits of any decade, there were really good songs that have lasted a long time. Yeah. For every one of those, there's hundreds of other ones that, that were just crappy songs that got played a little bit and no one ever heard again. And, you know, I would love to have a song or something that might last you know, through the years, but you just don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think you already, you obviously already do have a song that lasted. Like there's nobody that doesn't know, you know, uh, that song, you know what I mean? And then there's like, if they go to see, like I learned some stuff that I hadn't heard, uh, when I saw you live and yeah. I immediately wound up up and I was like, this is great. Like it still resonates. And That's even cool. like music, like you said, like, yeah. And like, there's a bunch of good stuff, you know, there's a bunch of good music. I think oh, yeah. like, I, no, um, and but it is it's funny because it's just finding it like not even like like you're right, like there was always a bunch of crappy music back then, too, and even some stuff they would play on the radio like ad nauseum or whatever, right? You know, like it's my not song. It either. No, <laughs> yeah, that's what they, no, yeah, they did, they did, they played it to death, just like I remember yeah, that's what they do. I mean. Yeah, that's how but they do they do that kind of stuff. Like I remember B ninety eight five was like our radio station back in the day, like for mm -hmm. New Jersey. And like I, I mean, I swear to God, if I hear this song, I immediately start want to like, you know, uh, um, Madonna had a song out at the time when I was working in a concession stand making chicken nuggets and fries at a beach, and it was like Ray of Light, and they would play it every five minutes. And I swear to God, when I hear it, I get like anxiety. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like a it's like a war crime. Like I'm like, my God, please turn whatever that is off. I can't handle it. <laughs> I imagine a line or you know eighty degree heat. Uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah, there's a bunch of cool stuff, and I think like as much as I I know the streaming services like fuck everybody over. Um, it's a cool way to find newer, newer shit. Like I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wish it, I wish they paid everybody more and I wish it was more lucrative for everybody that's working hard, but yeah. I, I have found a bunch of cool stuff like, you know, and I try to go see everybody live and shit, you know? Yeah. And absolutely. I mean that it has opened up that and to where yeah. much easier to, to, to search for music. Um, and there is so much out there. Uh, and years ago, I found this radio, this app called Radio, and it's got a bunch of O's at the end, like Radio. Ooh. And um, it's a, nice. it's a cool it little app because you can pick. I mean, it's a little weird, but for international, mm -hmm. especially for international music, you can pick a country and a decade, and then you can pick wow. you can pick you know normal or weird, slow or fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's kind of weird, but. Yeah. You know, you can find cool stuff from, you know, you can go going back to the 40s and 50s and in different countries. Cool. And it's interesting. And I enjoy that, too. Yeah. 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 My friends and I we always uh, talk about like sharing music is basically my love language. Like if I get a song from somebody, I'm like, oh, hell yeah. And then I just send them shit and we just trade back and forth and like, you know, try to find new stuff that we like and putting together playlists and stuff is, but radio sounds like a great, I love the idea of being able to hit the weird button yeah, and, and getting a bunch of cool shit like that kind of thrown at you. That's awesome. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you, uh, actually, you know what, wait, I got one more thing and then I'll ask you the last three questions that I ask uh, every guest on the show. Do you have any advice that you would give like some, some little, you know, uh, for anybody kind of coming up business wise? Cause I think the business aspect of this is like, the hardest part to navigate and i know you've you've Gosh. navigated it pretty well so like what i don't your... i don't know if i have uh um it's not easy you know it's uh i mean i think owning your own publishing as a songwriter is a great idea yeah um and that's the first thing people will give up typically is their publishing um right. if you can hang on to it you will do a lot better um, and then the other thing is just do what you do. I think even this goes with the business too, because as an artist, if you're, if you're trying to kind of follow whatever the trends are and the different styles that are hip at the time, it's not going to help your business out either because you're going to constantly be changing. Uh, you're, I, I remember seeing bands 
all through the 90s that were local bands here in Atlanta that would do different things to try to market themselves and and they weren't really concentrating on the the basics you know which is right good songs good band good singer and there you go that's all you really need that's why the black crows did well and uh, yeah. driving and crying other bands out of atlanta like the producers back in the 80s they were great but right. but you know just good it starts with good songs so for me that's kind of what i've always concentrated on and i'm not great with business and you know i didn't hang on to millions of dollars that that was made no, yeah. <laughs> I, I hung it i hung in there i i'm all i'm doing okay but you, nice. it's hard to make it's hard to make it last 25 years right so you sure, you, yeah. you invest what you can and i did more real estate and did okay but but i would say you know don't be stupid you know find someone right. that knows how to help you manage money if you end up doing well uh, cuz that's that's the hardest thing is um, keeping it you know if you do make money that yeah. you know I've never been that great, great with it. And luckily I just can kind of keep going out on tour and playing (laughs) for now anyway. And uh, yeah, man, I'll do it as long as I can. And there's some residuals and stuff, but, but like you say, you know, that's not what it was. And, uh, so so you kind of have to get out there and yeah, I would say though, the combination of being yourself musically and, and then making sure you have uh, good advice because I'm not the one that give it to them. You know, you, like someone that really knows how to manage money um, right. that won't steal from you. You know, that's the one thing I'm grateful for uh, related to the business around me is that my manager didn't steal from me. You know, like that's huge. Yeah. That, Absolutely. That's happened a lot. So, uh, yeah, as far as I know, it's happened to me early on. As far as yeah. I know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah he's watching this like uh <laughs> no like that that's that's awesome man i mean that, i feel like every little bit helps from from people who have, who've been around the block you know what i mean like we're all looking for a, a nugget of something that we can take with us uh, yeah and we all start off you know that whole be yourself thing and that sounds weird because we all start off musically most of us anyway start off kind of modeling after things that we like so we may, yeah. our voice may sound kind of like this person. We may play the guitar like this person. We may try to write like this, but after a, a little while, you need to find your own voice, right? And uh, sure. And that's, I think that's how it is with music, anyway. I think and um, original music is to, to try to find your own thing. And because uh, I spent a few years, kind of one, you know, trying to find it. I would, yeah, I would yeah. say four or five years of doing it before I was like, Oh, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. Would you, would you say that four or five years is, uh, an individual thing? Or do you think that's kind of the par for the course for musicians? Like around four to five years is when you'd start to discover who you are. Oh, I don't know. Because I've met, Hmm. I, I think I've met people that were very aware of their whole thing when they were teenagers, even and and could follow that so i think it's me i think that's just my individual right thing i think i think i just uh i like a lot of different types of music and i think i was trying to figure out how to blend it mm-hmm. and i think it took a while you know nice. i love i love soul and r&b but I also like, that, like you know the singer songwriters and the soul and you know yeah c- country music there's a little bit of everything in there so me too. Yeah, I've always liked folk. Folk music is something that I've always kind of liked, and uh, um, you know, I mean, I uh, this is one of those things where like I there's state. You know, I think you've heard people talk about this before. Like, and not to despair, like whatever, but stadium country music for some reason has been really popular. Like in the short, like where I like around the area that I live, uh-huh. and I just don't ju- like it. Doesn't resonate with me at all. But I right. do love like Merle Haggard. Like, I, I mean, it's one of those things, too, where, like, I love John Denver, man, and I know not a lot of people do. Me, too. But, like, yeah. Oh, oh that's so good to hear, man. Oh, come I, on, man. He was amazing. He was, he was I, so good. 
Yeah, he was the best. And I'm and I'm like, you know, oh, oh you'll love you'll love this story. And then I'll ask, then I'll hit you with the last three questions and let you get out of here. But um, so I was doing a gig at Rocket, uh, this place at the cutting room. I was with Ricky Bird from Joan Jet and the Blackhearts, uh, is a good friend, and then Paul Schaefer was there, mm-hmm. and then um Carmine uh, uh a piece. Um oh, yeah. and uh yeah, and like a few Few, just a few other of these guys because they, they basically the rocket organization is like they do it for kids who are musicians they go to this school and then they all graduate and they get to perform with like these epic you know like legends or whatever and and it's kind of cool yeah so i'm there i'm hanging out with everybody and eddie brigatti is there as well so i have a john denver shirt on that i love and we've been hanging out all night and then it gets to the end of the night and we all parked in the same garage so we're all walking back and Eddie goes, uh, is that a John Denver shirt? And I go, <laughs> and I go, yeah, man, I love, like, I love John Denver. You know what I mean? He's great. He goes, no, no, John Denver is awesome. And then out of the blue, him, me, him, Ricky, Carmine, and Paul, we're all walking in to get our cars. And Eddie starts singing, take me home country roads. Nice. And they all start singing it in this parking garage. And we're walking down doing this. And I'm like, this is the most surreal <laughs> <laughs> like all these guys love John Denver. Yeah, that made me so fucking happy, man. Well, of course, like, they this do. is great. He was. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard not to like him. He's. I know it's easy to kind of call it corny or whatever, but if you just, you know, it's it's incredible. His voice was right? incredible, oh and his God, songwriting was incredible. And yeah, and he could take a massive size venue and like bring them right into the palm of his hand. Absolutely. It's like, really, yeah. it's not easy to do. <laughs> yeah, man. I know. It's crazy. They just released uh, a live album of his that he did, I think, in Russia, in the Soviet okay. Union or whatever. And it's phenomenal. And they're like, you know, the uh, like, it's it's just crazy. It's so good. Like, I was like, oh, this is I'm like, wow, I wonder how he would go over in the Soviet. But they loved it. Oh, I bet they like, did. It, it, it's crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, I got man, to see him school. once. Um probably no way. yeah maybe 93 something like that he was great oh that's awesome yeah my mom has a ticket stub from seeing him at a college in like the early two. 70 or something like that she still has the ticket stub I, yeah i took a photo of it because it cost like a quarter or some shit you know what i mean like or whatever it was to go like i don't know how much it was like three bucks or something like that but it was like i was like holy shit this is crazy yeah she still has the ticket stub. that's too cool yeah. That was probably the worst biopic that I've seen, though, was the one on John Ember. Oh, my God, right? Horrible. Yeah, it wasn't good. Nope, not at all, man. I was so bummed with that one because I, I I would love a good one. That'd be amazing. Yeah. You know who looked like him? The dude from MASH who played the priest. <laughs> right? I can't think of his name, but I would be like, if he was still around yeah. and, and young, that'd be great. Father O'Malley or something like that, right? That's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That, yeah, that would be great. great. Yeah. Oh my God. He had the round glasses and the hair. And I was like, does he know he's got a doppelganger? That would have been weird. <laughs> Fucking wild. I, there's a great Kathleen Madigan joke. Cause she loves John Denver too. And she's talking about like, she'll go to her hotel room and she says, she's, she's like every night after a show, I'll go to my hotel room and PBS will be like, do you want to listen to John Denver? And I'm like, yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> she goes, and then she goes, and then she goes, and then they'll say something about him. And, and she goes, and then like an hour into it, I'm just crying. Like, why wouldn't he fill the tank? Why wouldn't you do that, John? <laughs> like, why would you just go up? Oh my God. So like, that's great. It's so great. I, yeah, feel it's the just, same. I know. I'm like, uh. All right, I'm gonna ask you the last three questions that I ask every guest that we have. Okay. Um, thanks for staying this long, man. I appreciate it. It was a good, yeah, good time. I, I hate that I'll have to I've gotta take my son to basketball practice here in a minute. So sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, no worries, man. I'll run with uh so the first question, bit of a softball question, but uh if you could go back in time and talk to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give yourself that would help you today? Um, stay, uh, keep dreaming. Stay, yeah. Keep your dreams. Don't let them. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I've had to get them back, you know? So, oh, all right. yeah. Um, second question is what had to end in your life, good or bad that led you to where you are today? Um, Um, probably, I guess, uh, 
the idea that I was going to be a soldier or a warrior of, of you know, like with a weapon in my hand. And I wow. wanted to become a different kind of warrior, a warrior, you know, one with a guitar. <laughs> so. Oh, that's so, that is epic, dude. That's a great way to put that. Um, and the last question ties into the show. So if this was a genuine dystopia and you woke up the next day and everybody found out last day on earth, what do you think would be happening? Would it be like a, do you think it would be like political collapse, climate change, aliens or zombies? And what would be your epic death? How you want to go out? Oh man, Jesus. That's a lot. I know, man. I know. A complicated, multifaceted question. Faceted question, yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I think it'd be interesting if, uh, I, I, I don't want that to happen, first of all, you know, like I'm, right. you know, but, uh, I, I wrote a song that, that kind of deals with that subject. And, uh, oh, nice. Yeah, I would say, uh, I want to go out without feeling a lot of pain, obviously. And, you know, I think most people yeah. feel that way. Um, and I, I don't know about the zombie thing. I would say, you know, the nuke thing is what I worry about. Worry about. Yeah, man. You know, you know the, the, that kind of thing. <laughs> It probably, yeah, yeah. Probably create zombies, though. Probably would. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know that. Would, we, would you be able to enter? Would you? Would you like put on a show for zombies? Do you think like music cures all? <laughs> would you try playing a little guitar? That'd be great. They could all sing along with with my my hit at the end. Yeah. <laughs> or, or I could leave before they, before I play it, and then they could attack the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my oh. god, that's great, dude! That is so fucking cool, man. Um, thanks again, man. It was, it's great meeting you and great talking to you. Oh, uh, John, I loved it, man. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Dystopia tonight.